So here's a hot take. Large language models don't actually understand language. Okay, that's actually a pretty lukewarm take, especially for my audience, because by now you understand that when you write in a prompt to say ChatGPT, that text gets turned into numbers known as tokens. And these numbers are what the model actually parses. But how do we come up with those numbers in the first place? That is what we're talking about today. So all models have a static list of tokens, effectively their vocabulary list. To create this list, we start with a corpus, a large body of text, and then break that into smaller chunks. Then we train a tokenizer to analyze those chunks and see which of them appear together most frequently. The result is a final vocabulary of tokens that the models use during training and inference. This is gonna be a lot clearer when we take a look at some of the examples. So how might you split up a corpus into smaller pieces? Well, a very simple approach would be to split it up by words, right? One token for every word. But that would result in a lot of tokens. And most models have limits to how big their vocab list can be, typically no more than 100,000 tokens. Now, Contrast that with the fact that English alone has over half a million words, Chinese has over 80,000 characters, and classical Arabic has something to the tune of 12 million word forms. I think count, you know, depending on if you're counting the different inflections and derivations of the root system. I don't really know, I don't speak Arabic. This is why in modern language models, tokens are just chunks of text that are commonly seen together. Today, the most common tokenization method is called byte pair encoding, or BPE. You start out by breaking things down into unique single characters, right? So one character equals one token. Then we look for the most frequent adjacent pairs of tokens. We then merge those two tokens together to create a new one, and we rinse and repeat this process all over until we've either hit our vocabulary limit or we've come up with enough words to you know, accommodate the corpus. Let's walk through this using a very simple body of text with just three words, low, lower, lowest. So the first thing we do is break these words into individual characters so they're represented like this. This gives us an initial vocab list of these characters. So these are our tokens, L-O-W-E-R-S-T. Now we count up the common pairs that we see in the words. Again, we're just looking for pairs. So we've got L and O, which appear three times, O, W appear three times, W, E appear two times, and so on and so forth. We then pick the most common pair and turn that into its own token. Uh, we've actually got a tie here, but we're just gonna pick one of them. So the tokens O and W frequently appear together. So we're gonna create a new token called O, W. And then we add that to our list. Now with our new vocab list, we can represent our words with fewer tokens because O and W, now that's one token. Then we do this again, looking for frequently appearing adjacent pairs. So in this case, we might notice that the token L is always close to O and W. So we create a new token, that's just the word low, and we add that to our list. Note that we haven't removed any of the original tokens, right? Those single character tokens are still there, but the tokenizer will always prefer the longest match. And this results in fewer tokens per word. We keep repeating this process again until we hit the vocab list or until we've found enough patterns that accommodate the language effectively. So far, we've talked about how we start by splitting words into single characters at first, right? And that worked for early natural language processing models that were heavily based on English. But modern models like the GPT family are multilingual. If we kept using characters as our smallest unit, we would run into that vocabulary limit very quickly. So how do we solve this? What is the smallest unit of information that works across all languages, alphabets, and scripts? Bytes. A byte is just a number between zero and 255. So if you tokenize at the byte level, you only need 256 base tokens. That's nothing. And just like characters, frequent combinations of bytes can then be turned into higher level tokens. So for example, the word for China in Chinese is Zhongguo, and that's two characters, but because it's appearing so frequently, it's represented as a single token. But a much rarer word like 
cow, which I think means like gluttonous and is only used in specific idioms or something. I, don't, I had to Google this one, I don't speak Chinese, but it's very uncommon. So it's not gonna get its own token. And it actually uses three tokens, one representing each byte in its UTF-8 encoding. So even languages with thousands of characters, it can all boil down to bytes because these are the fundamental universal building blocks for digital text. This same principle is the reason why LLMs can understand things like emojis, typos, slang, or even made up words. Because at the end of the day, it's all just bytes. As you probably know, tokens are not the end of the road. We still need to turn those tokens into embeddings. But how do you know what those embeddings should be? Well, when training a model, we start by assigning our tokens just a, a random vector. And then we store that in something like this called an embedding table. In the beginning, these embeddings are total garbage. But over time and with enough training, the model is able to refine these vectors into ones that become most useful in predicting the next token. In large language models, this refinement happens through a process called backpropagation. And this is how the model learns. It's also very complicated, so I'm, I'm just gonna have to save that for another video. So now you understand the, the birds and the bees of how tokens are made. If you have any questions or you have suggestions for, for new videos in the future, let me know in the comment section below. I'm sorry if you can hear some pitter pattering on the floor. My dog is wandering around. I really do wanna do a video on backpropagation and transformers. Those are two pretty complicated, especially transformers. That's gonna be a hard one. Y'all know I like to ramble at the end of these videos. I have no idea how to wrap this stuff up, but I, this is the unscripted part of my video. <laughs> There's a reason I have scripts. I cannot stay on track if I don't have a script. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.